Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everybody at the foundation and at my publishing house for welcoming me here, for hosting me here. I am I'm delighted to be here. How is everyone doing? All right? <laughs> Good. Um, I am very happy to have this opportunity uh, to speak about the urgent need for a Green New Deal. Uh, before we get started, I should offer an apology. <clears throat> um, in some of the, the promotion for this talk, it says that I will argue that this green future is inevitable. Um, I'm not sure where this idea of inevitability came from. Uh, it is true that it is necessary, um, but if there's one thing that three decades of political activism has taught me, it is that just because something is necessary, and just because millions of people recognize that it is necessary, that in no way makes it inevitable. Um, indeed, I begin this new book with a quote from the science fiction writer um, Kim Stanley Robinson, who I'm a big fan of. Um, I'll, I'll read you the quote. He says, the future isn't cast into one inevitable course. On the contrary, we could cause the sixth great mass extinction event in Earth's history or we could create a prosperous civilization sustainable over the long haul, either is possible, starting from now. So I want to emphasize that. Either is possible, starting from now. Earlier today, I was accused of being optimistic. Um, I corrected this. I'm not an optimist. I, I, I am a possibilist. I see a possible future. I see actually a very narrow pathway. Um, where we could have a thriving future. Um, and so I try to concentrate on how we improve our chances. Um, the truth is that the first option that Kim Stanley Robinson laid out, the mass extinction, the climate breakdown, it, that's the much more likely scenario. It is, in fact, already begun to unfold. And all indications would rationally tell us that this is what we are hurtling towards, whether those indications are the steadily warming temperatures year after year, whether it is the steadily increasing emissions year after year, whether it is the rightward lurch of our politics year after year. And the really distressing thing is that in order to get to that truly dangerous place, of ecological collapse. We don't need to do anything particularly dramatic. Climate breakdown is not like nuclear war. There's no big red button that a madman has to push in order to get us there. All we have to do to arrive at this quite terrifying future is just keep on doing exactly what we're doing now for another decade into the future, and we will, in fact, arrive at that unlivable future. On the other hand, if we're interested in option B that Kim Stanley Robinson lays out, the progressive civilization sustainable over the long haul, as he puts it, we do have to do a whole bunch of things really quickly, hard things, dramatic things. And that was the message of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their report that came out in October of last year about the need to keep warming levels below 1.5 degrees Celsius. They said if we want to have a good chance of keeping temperatures below 1.5, keeping warming below 1.5, then we need to cut global emissions by 45% in 12 years. Now, they said that last year, so that's now 11 years. That's the thing about time. It keeps moving on. Um, and, you know, climate scientists have learned to speak to us in clearer and clearer language because they've noticed that we don't pay attention very well, right? Um, so in the summary of the report, the authors say that it is possible to achieve this kind of steep emission reduction which in a rich country like Germany would mean about 10% emission reduction a year. Um, they say it is possible to do this, but it would require, and this is a quote from the summary, unprecedented transformation in virtually every aspect of society. 
Um, so this is not mad anti-capitalists, you know, saying this. This is our world's leading climate scientists um, drawing on 6,000 peer-reviewed sources to write this report. More than around, around 100 co-authors and reviewers um, that came up with this document. Um, and they laid out the, the, the areas where we would need this kind of unprecedented and fundamental transformation. Obviously energy to get to 100% renewable energy. Obviously we need to fundamentally change how we move ourselves around, um, our transportation systems, our agriculture systems, um, and the way we, we construct our buildings and how we live in cities. <clears throat> so, I'm awfully sorry that you were misled about the nature of my message tonight. You can request a refund at the door if you would like. For those of you who want to stay anyway, um, I'd like to begin um, looking back, if you don't mind. I have been thinking, because this week it is um, the UN Climate Summit, as you heard. It is in Madrid, Spain. This in and of itself is interesting, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about this in the, in, in the conversation afterwards. This, this cop was like a football getting kicked around the globe, and it's very much an expression of our times that this, that this UN Climate Summit was, was this sort of unwanted child. Originally, it was supposed to happen in Brazil. Um, but then Bolsonaro was elected, and he doesn't really believe in climate change and wants to burn down the Amazon. So he said, no, I don't want to host a climate summit. And so then Chile steps in, stepped in uh, under the right-wing government of Sebastian Piñera. Um, and he said, oh, I believe in climate change, but I also believe in market-based solutions. You know, um, Chile has been a laboratory for the Chicago School Economics. Jose Piñera is a billionaire beneficiary of, uh, of that system. In fact, his brother, Jose Piñera, um, was one of the proud Chicago boys who personally privatized the pensions under Augusto Pinochet, wrote the labor law under Pinochet. Um, and, cre and created a, a lock-in, what Jose Piñera, Sebastian's brother, described as a technified democracy. And a technified democracy um, is a democracy where you can vote for new governments, but you can't ever change the rules. I wrote about it in The Shock Doctrine, um, as you can have um, the keys to the door, but you can't have the combination to the safe. And they put in all of these sort of booby traps, the, the Chicago boys, for when democracy would come um, so that they couldn't actually change the economic system that they had introduced. And what this meant was that when, when Piñera decided that they were going to host the climate summit um, this year, that they wanted to look green, so they bought a whole bunch of electric buses. Um, but in Chile, if you, if you spend money, you have to offset it right, because you're not allowed to run up a deficit, so you have to pass the costs on to consumers. So they bought their electric buses, but they also increased transit. Um, and the rest is history. There was an uprising in Chile. Um, people said, it's not about the 30 pesos, it's about the 30 years. It is about these neoliberal policies. And there was such a powerful uprising that Piñera declared a state of emergency there's been tremendous and horrific repression in Chile of the likes of which we've not seen since the darkest days of the Pinochet dictatorship. And of course, this, the summit was canceled. And then Spain stepped in and said, we'll host it. We'll host it, but we don't have any money. So we're going to go to the biggest polluters in our country, the biggest carbon polluters, and ask them to sponsor our summit. And we'll give them a 90% tax break if they pay for the summit. And so, you know. The summit is now in Spain, and I think that this story, this story of the homeless, the homeless climate summit, tells us a lot, I think, about what we have been doing wrong and the sorts of backlashes that are being generated because of these failed responses to the climate crisis. So in Spain, this, the, the, this is COP25, which means that, uh, that for 25 years, our politicians have been meeting to talk about lowering emissions, to talk and talk and talk for 25 years, and every year emissions have gone up that they have been talking, including this year. But so I have been thinking about 
10 years ago. Um, and I wanted to show you an image. Let me see. Um, can we just put up the first slide? OK, great. So look at that image there. Um, it may not look it, but this image is exactly 10 years old. In December 2009, these billboards blanketed the city of Copenhagen during the 10 days that Copenhagen hosted that year's annual United Nations Climate Summit, COP15. <clears throat> and it was part of a broader campaign that, that was paid for by a coalition of environmental, non-governmental organizations, ENGOs. And the concept for the campaign was very simple. It showed photographs of the key leaders who were negotiating um, the agreement um, in Copenhagen. <clears throat> And it imagined them 11 years into the future, 2020, <clears throat> looking back at this pivotal moment when they had the power to negotiate the successor to the Kyoto Protocol. <clears throat> and as you see there, the message was, I'm sorry, we could have stopped catastrophic climate change. We didn't. Um, I think that this message was designed to appeal to these leaders' love for their kids, for their grandkids. Um, or maybe it was also designed to appeal to their egos and their desires for an admirable legacy, or maybe a little bit of each. Um, so that was the one for Obama. There was one for Sarkozy. There was one for Gordon Brown. There was one for Lula. There was one for... Um, can we put up the next slide? Yeah. Um, sorry, my, the clicker's not working, so I'm going to leave this. Um, I'm sorry, I did not design this. Um, uh, <laughs> all right, take that down. Put the next one. There's a, put up the group one. OK. All, all the I'm sorry's. OK. Um, <laughs> so this campaign has been on my mind, um, of course, because in a little bit more than two weeks, we will have reached the dateline, 2020. We will be at the year that they were supposed to be looking back at this pivotal moment. And to be honest with you, this has also been on my mind because I knew I was going to be delivering this lecture. And Willy Brandt, Willy Brandt um, in whose name we gather, is known, as you all know, for many historic accomplishments. But outside of Germany, what he's most known for is a single, silent act of contrition. He is the chancellor who fell to his knees at the memorial for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And with that single act, he became one of very few leaders in the modern age who was able to convincingly express true contrition. And as a Jewish person who grew up around survivors, I'm not one of these environmentalists who casually compares climate change to the Nazi Holocaust. Killing millions with genocidal intent is not the same as allowing the planet to warm in ways that will cause drought and famine for millions upon millions of people. But make no mistake, failing to do what is necessary to avoid climate breakdown, especially when we have the tools, especially when we have been warned and warned and warned by the leading scientific experts, is its own kind of crime, its own kind of moral crime. And I would argue that it is also a crime against humanity. And, This is the message that we have been getting from young people in the Fridays for Futures movement around the world, that this is a crime against their right to a future. But we heard this same thing in Copenhagen 10 years ago. We heard it um, from the delegates coming from Pacific Island nations. We heard it from the African bloc, who at one point, when the draft text of the Copenhagen Agreement leaked out, walked out en masse from all of the different negotiating spaces, and they chanted in the halls of, of the Bella Center in Copenhagen, we will not die quietly, and they called it genocide. Um, this has been foretold. We cannot claim that we did not know. We cannot claim that we were not warned. 
So 10 years later, it seems worth asking how this campaign stands up. And to me, a few things jump out, like that's a very bad computer generation of an aged Angela Merkel. She should sue them for that. The computer generation for Obama is pretty good. Um, it, it looks, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty damn accurate. <clears throat> The other thing that becomes clearer and clearer to me looking back at that moment, and frankly, it's, it gets harder to look back on the missed opportunities of 2009 for me, is that this really was an opening to do things differently. And I want to talk about that. Um, let us recall that in 2009, when these politicians met, um, the world was very much in the grips of the financial crisis. The banks had just been bailed out, as had the auto companies and the insurance companies, but it wasn't yet sure how they were going to be re-regulated. And it wasn't yet sure, it, was, it wasn't yet clear who was going to pay the costs of this crisis. That was still very much up for grabs, how we were going to rebuild in the aftermath of that crisis. Austerity had yet to be unleashed on Europe and so many other parts of the world. <clears throat> Obama had just been elected a year ago. It's worth remembering that on the night that he won the primaries and became the, the delegate for the Democratic Party, he famously said that this would be remembered as the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. So climate change was very much part of his mandate, very much part of what he was elected to act upon. Europe was so excited that the Nobel Committee took the extraordinary step of awarding Obama the Peace Prize just days before he went to the Copenhagen summit. <clears throat> and in part, the committee explained uh, in their statement that this was for the work he was about to do to tackle the climate crisis and also to stop America's endless wars. Now, no tangible progress had yet been made, several people pointed out, on either front, but it was anticipated based on what Obama had signaled in his speeches. Perhaps in retrospect, we can see this as the first Nobel Prize awarded for virtue signaling. But <laughs> um, there was an incredible amount of just hope in the air when we all went to Copenhagen. And this is what I'm trying to convey to you. In fact, the city of Copenhagen rebranded itself Hopenhagen <laughs> ahead of the summit. And there were Hopenhagen signs all over the city. And it was sort of a temporal and geographic extension of Obama's electoral campaign, which of course was you know, the hope and change campaign. <clears throat> and people brought very, very high hopes into that space. The African and Pacific Island states demanded commitments from wealthy countries to do everything possible to keep temperatures uh, from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius and to put binding commitments in place to hold governments responsible. And one of the things that I most remember, and I wrote about this, I write about this in, in, in the new book, was that Bolivia's climate negotiator, chief climate negotiator, was a young woman named Angelica Navarro. And she gave this amazing speech about the need for what she called a Marshall Plan for planet Earth. Um, and it was ahead of its time, <laughs> or maybe not. Um, but she, uh, she, she laid out a vision for what a justice, a truly justice-based response to the climate crisis would look like. And that began with the countries that had been emitting carbon for a couple of hundred years and had such a head start, cutting their emissions in line with science by 7 to 10 percent a year. But she also said this. She said this plan would mobilize financing and technology transfer on scales never seen before. It must get technology onto the ground in every country to ensure we reduce emissions while raising people's quality of life. We have only one decade. And I find it really heartbreaking to think about what is happening in Bolivia now, including what is happening to Bolivia's glaciers. I remember meeting with the Bolivian delegation in Copenhagen at the start of the, of the summit. And Angelica and others said to me, we never thought we would negotiate so close to death. And what they were referring to was what it is like to live under these 
towering glaciers in La Paz and El Alto and know that your fresh water source is at risk, is at dire risk, and watch those glaciers disappear and know how little time you have left. And that was what they proposed. They proposed a response to the climate crisis that was in line with science but guided by justice and would be an opportunity to heal the wounds that scar our worlds and that date back to colonial pillage and are the reason why we have such profound inequalities in our world. And that was the vision, but they were not listened to. Some of us in the North also had ideas that we brought to the Copenhagen summit about the need to bring together the solutions to that financial crisis, to the economic crisis that was rocking our world, and the solutions to the climate crisis. And we argued that these crises should be tackled in concert under a framework that is now being called a Green New Deal. And it was an idea very much inspired by FDR's original New Deal, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, this um, was a sweeping framework of policies, not one policy or two policies, but really um, an umbrella under which FDR governed for nine years when he came to power in the midst also of a twin crisis. People forget that in the 1930s when Roosevelt was elected, the U.S. was in the grips of the Great Depression, but also in the midst of the Dust Bowl, of the ecological crisis of the Dust Bowl. And so this panoply of policies was introduced that included everything from social security to unemployment insurance to breaking up the, and regulating the banks. Um, but also FDR um, sent out two million young people in what he called the Civilian Conservation Corps. And they went out and they planted 2.3 billion trees in a mass reforestation program. That's more than half the trees ever planted in the United States. FDR also believed in this very German idea about the salutary uh, effects of getting out into the natural world. He, he, he was actually on the board of the Boy Scouts. He really believed that his country was not just in an economic depression, but that people were psychologically depressed and that the way that his job was also to lift up people's spirits. And so part of what the Civilian Conservation Corps did is they built 800 state parks, trails through the parks, and the idea was that everybody should have a right to nature, to be able to get out into the wilderness, um, into the forests, and so that was part of how they created jobs. They also had multiple programs um, to give people access to the arts, um, to, uh, to create hundreds of thousands of new works of arts, murals, plays, um, and this was part of the New Deal era. It also electrified rural America. So there are many ways in which the New Deal shows us the kinds of scale and transformations that we actually need in the face of the climate crisis um, because it did transform the infrastructure of the country, um, but it did also invest in the parts of our societies that all the research shows actually increases well-being. So I'll come back to that. But the idea that, um, that was being put forward in Copenhagen for many in civil society was that we needed an approach to the climate crisis that would stimulate the economy, that would create good jobs, um, that would give us energy democracy. We took a lot of inspiration from the energy transition in Germany in this way, um, because we knew that many jobs were being created in Germany in the energy transition, um, and that much of the renewable energy was community controlled, municipally owned, um, and was not just um, money going to more big businesses. <clears throat> but of course, none of these, I think, very good ideas were taken up in Copenhagen. What actually happened is that wealthy countries responsible for the majority of historical emissions shot down pretty much every one of these um, proposals. And the US insisted on a target that would allow temperatures to rise by two degrees Celsius, despite all those passionate objections. The US, Australia, and Canada categorically rejected the argument that wealthy countries owe compensation to poor countries who did next to nothing to create the climate crisis. Um, and the US, backed by the EU, also rejected all attempts to make the deal legally binding. 
and uh, instead argued that they should be voluntary targets um, and that each country should be able to set their own national targets. And then what they, the, the plan was, we'll come together in Paris in 2014 and we'll add up all of our voluntary targets and we'll hope that it adds up to what it would take to actually keep temperatures below 1.5 to 2 degrees. And what happened in Paris is that when you added up all of the national targets, um, it actually didn't add up to what it would take to keep temperatures below 1.5 to 2 degrees. It actually added up to more like 3 to 4 degrees. And in addition, it's not legally binding. So there's no ramifications, no sanctions for not meeting your own voluntary targets or walking away from the agreement entirely, which Trump has done and Bolsonaro pretty much has done as well. <clears throat> so we are still very much dealing with the impacts of the decisions that were made in Copenhagen. <clears throat> um, what else? Um, as for the demands for a Green New Deal, in the US and Europe, uh, the idea of integrating the responses to the financial crisis with the responses to the climate crisis, these didn't go anywhere as well. Instead, the banks, the insurance companies, and the car companies were bailed out to the tune of trillions of dollars, but there was virtually no relief for homeowners or for, work, from workers, for workers. The Troika and the IMF went on to pre prescribe brutal austerity here in Europe and around the world. Some countries did introduce climate policies, but they remained for the most part within this so-called market-based framework, which basically meant austerity as usual, but in addition, we will increase the price of your power and increase the price of, of gasoline um, through some kind of carbon pricing scheme. And so climate action came to be associated with increased costs of living. In some cases, this wasn't actually true. It was misinformation. But in a lot of cases, it actually was true. Um, and as people's economic conditions worsened and as austerity really began to bite, um, this came to seem like a more and more untenable decision. <clears throat> um, so these were fateful decisions. They have ignited the fires of climate disruption and the political fires of far-right hatred, or at least they have fueled them in ways that I think we've only begun to understand. And I do think we need to understand it. Um, you can put up the, the, the title once. We don't have to look at these guys the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to use the other slides. It's OK. <clears throat> so I want to talk about, I want to talk for the, for the remaining few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about fire. I want to talk about the three different kinds of fires that we are facing, because that's how I've come to understand um, our political moment. Greta says our house is on fire, and she is right. In Sydney, all week, um, the city has been engulfed in smoke. And I'm sure many of you have seen these images um, uh, of, of these bushfires and, um, and the Sydney Opera House and this haze of smoke. One of the amazing things that we're hearing from people in Sydney is that in many buildings, the smoke alarms are going off, the fire alarms are going off en masse. And so they are literally hearing the fires, uh, <laughs> telling them our house is on fire. It's not the building that's on fire. It's the smoke from outside the building that is going into the building and setting off the fire alarms. So if that's not a metaphor for our house being on fire, I don't know what is. Um, and this is just one glimpse, the most recent one, of the crisis that we're facing. The decade since Copenhagen um, has been the hottest decade on record, where my family lives in British Columbia, Canada. Um, and we now talk about summer as smoke season, not, you know, because for the past three summers, the entire Pacific Northwest has just been enveloped in this cloud of smoke. And it's one of the things that I write about um, in the book is, is you know, what it is like. It's not, I've been in a lot of different kinds of disasters. You know, I've, you know, hurricanes and all kinds of superstorms and floods. But there's something about the relentlessness of living with this kind of smoke. It's not something that happens for a couple of days. It happens for like 
an entire summer. It happens, you don't see this, uh, the, the actual sun for you know, one summer for almost a month. Um, and that really wears down on people. It has huge impacts on people's health and also on their spirits. I mean, there's a sense of just like there being a lid on the world, on possibility itself. And this has impacted this younger generation in profound ways. Many school days have had to be canceled um, because the air quality isn't good enough. And this is a big part, at least in North America, of what's radicalized this generation. So many people's lives have been directly impacted, whether by the fires, whether by flooding, whether by these staccato superstorms, and of course, in this decade since Copenhagen, we have seen these mega historic storms um, that have been extremely deadly, like Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, which took more lives uh, than the Twin Tower attacks. More than 3,000 people died in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, another absolutely deadly storm, Cyclone Idai in Mozambique, and on and on. Um, we are losing some of the most incredible wonders in our world, both natural and human created. We're watching Venice disappear. We've lost half the Great Barrier Reef, the largest structure made up of living organisms on our planet. We have lost most Arctic summer sea ice. You know, these are major features of our planet that we are losing. And then there is the Amazon, um, which is not disappearing because of climate change, but really because of arson. But in some ways, all of this is arson because we knew, we were warned, we did it anyway. <clears throat> so this is what one degree of warming looks like. <clears throat> And as I said, the IPCC has told us that we have this very, very, very short window to do extraordinary things if we want to keep warming levels below 1.5 degrees Celsius and even, frankly, below 2 degrees. If every ounce of our energy was focused on the transformation, it would be hard enough to pull off a truly epic task. And yet, at this same moment, the men rising to the highest office in country after country are not only refusing to douse the flames, convinced in some cases that their wealth will protect them, but they are, like Bolsonaro, true planetary arsonists, determined to torch the planet with glee. That picture that was up there for too long of all those leaders, it's striking to think about what that would look like now. Obama has been replaced by Trump, Lula by Bolsonaro, Gordon Brown by Boris Johnson. We'll see. Um, <laughs> and I think you know that the world fears for the post-Merkel era in Germany. And you know what we are seeing are these accelerated attacks from many of these figures on the natural world. And I don't have enough time to tell you all of the things that Trump is doing to attack environmental regulations and standards on every front, to crack open every protected piece of wilderness, to unrestrict, unrestricted drilling, um, trolling Greta on Twitter, again, ogling Greenland. You remember when he said he wanted to buy Greenland? Well, I mean, why does he want to buy Greenland? Because it is now valuable, not just because of opening trade routes, but also because of all the oil and gas underneath the melting ice. <clears throat> Scott Morrison in Australia, um, he very famously went into their house of government holding a big hunk of coal and declaring that coal is good for humanity, don't be afraid of it, and explaining why they were going to go ahead and dig the world's largest coal mine, the Adani mine. Um, and you know the fact that his country is on fire doesn't seem to have changed his mind at all. Um, around the world, we are seeing a rise in these strong men figures. There's Trump, there's Bolsonaro, there's also Modi, Duterte. There's some who've been around for a while and seem to be more emboldened, like Putin. And one of the things that I do in this book is, you know, they're all different. All of these national contexts are different. But we are seeing a kind of common playbook emerge. Um, and there's a real cross-pollination. I don't know if, if, if the Howdy Modi rally was covered 
um, here, but when Modi went to the US recently, they had a huge rally. Trump had a huge rally for him in Texas called Howdy Modi. Um, and Trump and Modi get along, um, and they get along for a reason. Trump and Duterte get along. They get along for, for a reason. Um, there is a, there, there is a playbook that involves this clear definition of a national in-group that each of them have. The, you know, the real Americans or the real Indians or what, whoever the defined in-group is that they are there to represent. And then they have each of them, their out-groups, right? The out-groups within their countries and outside their countries who want to get in, right? And their whole political playbook is about protecting their in-group from the other, from the criminal, the drug dealer, the invader, right? This is how Trump came to office, promising to build a wall with Mexico, calling Mexicans rapists and so on. Um, all of this creates the rationale for the detention facilities that have been called concentration camps in the United States, these horrific conditions under which immigrants are being held in the United States. But the real playbook that we are seeing is the attempts to prevent migrants from ever reaching the borders of majority white countries and continents. We have a pattern that actually I think was pioneered in Australia with the outsourcing of detention facilities, the intercepting of the boats, and taking migrants to island detention uh, camps on Manus and Nauru. You know, in the context uh, of these huge inequalities between our countries, this is being presented as a new economic development models for countries without a lot of options. They say, you can be the jailers for our migrants. And it's particularly stark when Australia does it to island nations who themselves are highly vulnerable to climate change and are tomorrow's migrant, climate migrants. And they say, well, we'll give you some money to house our privatized migrant detention camps and the, and, the, and the conditions on Manus and Nauru by multiple human rights observers have been described as tantamount to torture. They are so desperate that migrants are setting themselves on fire to try to get the world's attention. And the European Union has adopted the Australian model of trying to keep migrants from ever reaching these shores. And this is the de facto let them drown policy, but it is also the policy of outsourcing um, the migrant so-called rescue to the Libyan um, Navy, um, or so-called Navy, which is really a bunch of warlords who are taking people to more horrific camps where people are facing sy systematic abuse. Now, Trump has looked at this and he said, this is a good idea. He doesn't have any water, but what he is now doing is after um, cutting hundreds of millions of dollars of aid to Central America, this is a part of the world that is extremely vulnerable to, to drought, that has, that has suffered under multiple years of drought, and this is one of the major drivers of migration. Um, he said, well, you can make some money by housing our migrants. And so now the plan is for, for, for migrants to never reach the United States, for people to be tur turned around before they get there, sent back to El, Sal sent to El Salvador, sent to Guatemala, and they're signing these agreements like the agreements that the EU has signed with Libya. Um, so there is this, uh, this pattern, the in-group, the out-group, <clears throat> and the outsourcing um, of the incarceration of migrants. And I see these as two fires that are not unrelated. I don't think it is a coincidence that as the climate crisis becomes increasingly undeniable, as it is no longer something far off in the distance, but is banging down our doors and people are living it. These strongmen figures are coming to power all around the world, and they're tapping into feelings of profound unease, insecurity, and scarcity. It is not all about climate change. I recognize that. There are many, many drivers of insecurity that they are tapping into. Um, and some of that is the insecurity that comes from these decades of austerity, and in particular, the last decade that has so accelerated insecurity around the world, attacked labor protections, shredded social safety nets, opened up chasms of inequalities, and created this world where if you are not one of the winners, then you are one of the losers. And this is you know, Trump's expertise, right? This was the plot 
of The Apprentice, the reality show that made him famous. Um, you're either a winner or you're a loser, and listen to me, I'll turn you into a winner. This is the promise that brought him to the presidency, be on the side of the winners instead of the losers. That's his favorite insult, is to call somebody a loser. <clears throat> They are tapping into that economic insecurity, and they are also tapping into planetary insecurity. And I'm not really interested if they claim to deny climate change or not. We all know on some cellular level that life on this planet is in crisis, that our one and only home is unraveling. No one, no matter how much Fox News they watch, is protected from the feeling of existential terror that flows from that. And what men like Trump and Bolsonaro and Matteo Salvini understand is how to make other people's fear work for them. So they rile up hatred, they weaponize desperation, they run campaigns based on building walls and stopping pending invasions. And most of all, they sell their respective in-group the illusion that they will finally be secure in our age of rampant insecurity. It's worth remembering on this evening of the UK election, that the slogan of the Brexit campaign that, that, um, <clears throat> that Johnson was so central to was take back control. That was the promise. They're not going to get it, but they are reaching for it. And it is the illusion of control that all of these men are selling by pitting populations against each other, which frees them up for the true business at hand, which is looting the last remaining swaths of wilderness on our warming planet. So those are the two fires that we're facing. The reason why I do still have that sliver of hope, the reason why I am a possibilist, if not an optimist, is because there is another fire. There is another fire burning, and it is the fires of these growing climate justice movements around the world including Fridays for Future, which has spread with incredible speed in just one year, it, especially here in Berlin, where I think you saw the largest march in the history of your city. I mean, this is tapping into something incredibly powerful. Um, eight million people participated in the September climate strikes. And it was young people, but it was people of all generations. It was people walking out at places like Amazon and Microsoft, going on strike against their tech companies, demanding another kind of world. Um, and there are also fires, where I come from, demanding this thing that we're calling a Green New Deal. Um, and what is not just exciting, but essential about this framework is having this resurgence. As I said, we didn't invent it. It's an idea that comes from the global south. It's an idea that's been around for a long time, but it is coming back up with a huge new energy that is coming from this new generation of activists. And it is about putting out both fires at once. It says, yes, we need to listen to scientists. We need to cut emissions very, very rapidly. We need to be guided by that most recent IPCC report, and we need to be guided by justice. So in countries like the US and Germany, that means we don't have 11 years to cut our emissions in half. We need to do even more than that. We need to cut by more like 80% in those years. And we need to put serious financing on the table so that countries that did next to nothing to produce this crisis but are on the front lines have the resources they need to leapfrog to renewable energy and other green tech, to keep their forests intact and not have to dig up the oil and gas under precious rainforests, but help them do that, help them protect their forests, and also provide financing for loss and damage that is already locked in. But the whole, the whole idea behind a Green New Deal is it is a response to the rallying cry of the Gilets Jaunes movement that says, you care about the end of the world, we care about the end of the month. A Green New Deal says everybody cares about the end of the world and the end of the month, and nobody should ever be asked to choose again. So we need a framework to create millions of unionized jobs that support families. We need to put in a floor for people that guarantees health care, that guarantees the basics, that, bear, that guarantees housing, that guarantees child care, that, that addresses that, that rampant insecurity that 
creates such a flammable political context for the demagogues of the world to come in and rile up and say, you know what, we're going to put in a floor so that we don't have to turn on each other as we face these shocks, as we face these tests. And then once we do that, we are going to lower emissions rapidly. We are going to tackle consumption. We can't have endless growth of consumption on a finite planet. As Greta said at the United Nations, that is a fairy tale. But this vision is spreading with incredible speed. I'm just going to wrap up because I want to have time for our discussion. But you know, this really is a story of young people. It's a story of young people on the inside and the outside. A year ago, um, the Democrats took back Cong the Congress, which was a really exciting moment um, uh, for that political party. Um, they went to Washington feeling triumphant. Um, they expected a victory parade after having the, won this big electoral victory in the midterms, and that isn't what happened. What happened instead is that hundreds of young people with the Sunrise Movement, um, which is a movement that takes its name from that great ball of life-giving fire in the sky, um, occupied the offices of the most powerful Democrat in Washington, Nancy Pelosi, and they said, we want a Green New Deal. And they held signs that said, we deserve good jobs and a safe planet. Um, and, they, and they brought, they married together economic justice um, and, and the need for climate action. And they said that frontline communities, um, the places where black and brown people live, where immigrants live, the most, the most neglected and, 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 and polluted neighborhoods and regions in the country need to be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects, to have those green jobs, they said no worker should be left behind. And they made these supposedly radical demands. But then something remarkable happened. They were visited by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 29 years old, the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. A few months earlier, she'd been working as a waitress um, uh, in a bar in New York City, but decided to run, decided to challenge, actually, first in, in, in a primary, a Democrat who was not representing uh, that district, one of the poorest districts in the United States. And she won this huge upset. Um, and she visited their occupation and she says, said, I'm standing with you. We're going to get this done. We're going to fight for our future. And a few days later, the framework for a Green New Deal came out. And people said, it's way too ambitious. It's crazy. But it pulled so well and it was so popular and there was so much momentum behind it that the majority of Democrats running to lead the, the party and to run against Donald Trump in the next election had to endorse this framework and say that they believed in it. And over the course of this election campaign, um, the various candidates have had to produce hundreds of pages of policy saying what a Green New Deal would look like, how they would pay for it, where the money is going to come from, and they're in a kind of an arms race for who's going to spend you know, more, more money and do more bold things um, that marry together the imperatives of justice and climate action. Um, so it's an exciting time, and this is spreading around the world. There's now talk of a global Green New Deal. Um, I, would, I, I wouldn't trust it too much if it comes from above, is all I will say. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the kind of action that we need right now is going to come from an interplay of social movements that have a democratic process of really sourcing what this looks like so that there, there's real ownership over it. It's going to come from unconventional alliances. It's going to come from, from unions and environmentalists and migrant rights activists and anti-war activists coming together and designing a common agenda. Um, but I'll just leave you with um, my favorite slogan from the, from the Fridays for the Future movement, which comes from the UK climate uh, strikers. They say, Greta was the spark, but we are the wildfire. And I think that's what we need to, to be in the face um, of these other twin fires. We've got to be the wildfire. Thank you.